here for the first time. Especially glad you're here today. I uh, want to draw your attention to the cards in the, uh, the back of the chair in front of you. They're used to call them green cards. Now we have three different cards, okay? Trying to make it as confusing as possible. No, I'm just teasing. Um, so if you're a guest, you would fill out the yellow one that says guest. <clears throat> if you're a member or regular tender, that would be the blue one. It says member and regular tender. And if you're uh, wanting to get more involved in what's going on here and be a part of what God's doing at Bedford Acres, then the Put Me In Coach, the green card, is for you. Uh, you can fill out more than one card. Just don't do the blue and the yellow one on the same Sunday. Okay? I'm messing with you. All right. Thank you. All right. I got things flying all over the place. couple quick announcements. Date night dinner fundraiser for the American Heritage Girls. That is uh, the Sunday night uh, girls ministry. And that is February the 5th. That's in two weeks from 6 to 8. It's a dinner here for uh, date night for, for uh, adults. Okay, so the dinner includes an entree, dessert, and a drink. Donations are welcome. All the donations go to the American Heritage Girls, our troop that meets here. You can register at bedfordacres.com. Or I'm sure you could probably see Erin, and she could help you figure out how to make that happen. Uh, also, Super Bowl is three weeks away. It's hard to believe it's that close. It's Sunday, February the 12th this year. Uh, we are uh, wanting to host some Super Bowl outreach parties in homes this year. So I had about three or four people. I know of maybe about six different uh, homes that are planning on doing this. Uh, we're just asking you to invite your friends over and have a Super Bowl party, which you might be having one anyway. Use halftime as a way to just share about your faith. Uh, I'm putting together packets, all kinds of things that you can use just to have a great Super Bowl party and putting together a Devo that you can either show or do yourself, that kind of thing. If you're interested in that and want to uh, see the packet and do it, I can't do finish the packet until the last two teams are determined. So we've got, you got uh, four more teams playing today, and then you've got four teams playing next time to figure out who goes in the Super Bowl. And then we've got two weeks to get everything together and get it to you. But uh, my phone number's on here. You can pick these up with the information or come see me. Uh, would love to get you some information on that. Really excited about just a fun way to share our faith with our friends, okay? Um, also, uh, there's a congregational meeting next week in one week. That's after church. And this week, the teens are doing a meal at Russell Cave Church. You want to see Carl about that. That's this week the teens are doing that. And we're also looking for somebody to do the meal on February the 28th. That's about a month and a half away. Uh, need a, a family, home group, um, class would like to do the meal at Russell Cave uh, for them. Okay, great thing to do. Stand with me, please. Let's pray. Lord, we lift our hands to you because we acknowledge that you're a God who's worthy of our praise. You deserve it above all else and everyone and everything else. Lord, every good and perfect gift that we have comes from you, it says in your word. 
You're such a gracious and merciful, amazing God. And so this morning we give to you. We sing praises to you. We listen to your word. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would come invade this place, that your presence would be here this morning, that we'd hear from you. Ask you, to look, Lord, to come and minister to each and every one of us today. Give us a commitment, a dedication, a courage, a boldness to follow you every moment of our lives because you deserve it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Turn and greet one another and uh, tell them you're glad they're here. What's up? How you doing? Oh my goodness. There's almost 300 people in here and you guys can't be louder than that. That's all right. That's all right. We'll get there. What's up? Hey. You want to sing some more? I can tell jokes. No? Okay. Watch it over there. I'll get Don Minky up here and you'll listen to jokes all day long. Oh
this out with me, church. Hallelujah.
You may be seated. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the week is uh, getting to come in here and, yes, do this with you guys. But before you all flood into here, um, we, we sit up here and we have a Bible study and we get to pray together. And it's, it's just a great thing. Uh, and this morning it was on um, Saul and understanding the situation with Saul and that he was persecuting Christians and put them in prison and, and it was just a thing, right? <clears throat> so my question was, when was your Saul to Paul moment? What did that look like? Um, and for some of us, it was, it was just, it was all very different, right? But I'm going to tell you mine. Mine was uh, in 2012, my father, uh, well, he'd been eaten up with cancer for a long time. And uh, we went to the hospital, and um, my dad was in pre-op with me, and uh, or I was in there with him, rather. And um, I asked him, I said, you know, what do you want me to do? And uh, he said, well, I want to live. And I, no kidding. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to make sound decisions. I want you to trust God. And, uh, and, and those were the hardest things that, uh, that, that I could do in the moment, right? Um, and he goes away, and those were the last things that, that he said to me. And the surgeon comes out, and he says, your dad can't regulate his blood pressure. His body temperature is all over the place. Uh, they actually pulled him out mid-surgery, and uh, they said, you know, we're, we're maxed out on medication to regulate him. If you let him live, this is how he will be for the rest of his life if you choose to keep him. That moment was where I really started to question what God's plan was and how much of a gracious God he was. Is that wrong for me to do that? No, I think that that's part of the relationship to ask God what's, what's going on here. But when we decided to let him go, it was hard because you're searching for God and peace and love and grace and all the things that you ask for from this loving God that we worship. But that wasn't comforting to me losing my dad, obviously. But it took a couple of days and you finally start to realize that's probably the most gracious thing that God could have done was take him home. So realizing that we are God's children before we are moms, dads, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, before any of that, we are God's child, created in the image of this loving, almighty God. And so if you're struggling with something today and you feel like there's, a, there's a, something in your heart that's hard to deal with, maybe it's a loss of a loved one, maybe it's news you didn't want to get, losing your job, whatever it is, God's grace is sufficient. We, we have these tangible things that we like to get because it's, it's the here and now moment that gives us the satisfaction. And sometimes it takes time for God to work through things, and part of the thing he's working through is allowing you to trust in him and realize that his sovereignty and his grace is greater than anything we can understand. But if my dad were alive today, he would still have a breathing tube, he would still be hooked up, and he'd be unconscious. It's better sometimes to let things go and let God have them. And it's so hard sometimes because we hold on to everything that we can. With such a tight grip, white knuckle syndrome comes in. And the whole time, God's just standing there with his hand out and just asking us to trust him with it. And it hurts, and it doesn't seem fair, and it doesn't seem logical because our minds are so minute that we don't get God. But he's gracious. He's gracious. And so when you take your communion this morning, think about that body and the blood that was shed for you. One of the most gracious things God could have done for us is die for us. He allowed his son to be beaten to be nailed to a cross in the middle of two thieves born into a stable that we could have life 
If that's not grace, I don't know what that is. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for who you are. And in regard to our struggle and hardship and things that we don't understand and we would probably do differently, God, we thank you that you are a gracious and loving God. My prayer this morning is that we will somehow find a way to turn to you in these struggles and be able to open our hand and pour out into your hand whatever those things are. With faith and trust, we do this, Lord. I pray for each individual in here this morning that, God, maybe they haven't turned to you ever. I pray they do that this morning, God, and they find out just how loving you are. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen. pray with me again. God, you've called us to be faithful in a lot of things, in following you and in trusting you and in putting our life in your hands again. God, you've called us to do this. You've told us to do this. And Lord, I pray that we all do it in faith. God, that, so that we can somehow turn this back to your kingdom. We thank you for the blessings. Amen. personal question <clears throat> does anybody in here need like a personal like revival in their life raise your hand be bold does anybody need a personal revival in their life something that you need to just give up and give to God and say I don't want this anymore I want you to have it as we sing this song right before the sermon this is this is my prayer are you bold enough to join us up here at the altar. Let's lay it down together as a church family. I'm going to ask our ladies, if you will, anybody else, Dean, Don, Dan, let's, let's make this a thing here. If there's something in your life that you need to just lay down and let God have, and you want to make something different today, you want God to change something today, do it right now. That's my prayer. Be bold in this. We'll do this together. This is not anything other than what it's supposed to be right now. Because He is the God of revival. He is the one who can take something stagnant and make it flow again. He is the one. Would you sing this with me?
darkest night you can light it up you can light it up oh god of revival let hope arise death is overcome god you
pray with me? Lord, we love you. And we thank you that you are the God of revival. Move among this place. Move in our hearts. Give us the courage to follow your spirit. Lord, be with this message. Help me not to mess up what you're doing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad. That, wow, this is hot, hot, hot. <laughs> We are so glad that you're here this morning, and uh, if you're a guest, and we have a number of guests today, we are so thrilled that you guys came out today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the service so far, and if you haven't already done it, stop by the Welcome Center on the way out. We have a gift for you, and uh, just to say thanks for coming out. And for those of you that are regular folks, uh, and some of you I know are irregular, but if, if you are regular folks, uh, and some of the irregulars, make sure you, you welcome these folks. Let them know how glad we are that they're here. If there's someone sitting near you that you don't know, and I know some of you are thinking, well, maybe they come, maybe they don't. Maybe I don't want to embarrass myself. It's, it's easy. Just go up to them because you don't know their name and say, hey, I don't believe I've met you. And then they might say, well, it's our first time. Of course you haven't met me. That's okay. But uh, let them know how glad you are that they're here. There's one other announcement. Next Sunday is Fifth Sunday. Uh, and every fifth Sunday at our church, uh, we have family fifth Sunday. So the, all the kids from downstairs will be here. And if you are a guest with us today, there's probably 50 or 60 elementary and underage kids downstairs. And so that's why it's a little quieter in here. But we're always glad when they are in here. And uh, they will all be with us next week. And that's always exciting uh, in, in a lot of ways. But also next week, uh, Tony Wolf. Uh, you might remember Tony. Tony was with us a few years ago. Tony is a professional Christian comedian, and he is funny. But he's also a very, very good speaker and very good preacher. So he'll, he's going to be with us next Sunday, and he's probably not going to be doing the comedy as much as he is the preaching. And he is a representative. Uh, I know for years he was a representative of Compassion International, which is a great, great way for people to help children, uh, orphans in third world countries. And so he's going to talk about that a little bit and some other things that he's involved in. And it's you, you'll want to be here next week. Uh, you really don't want to miss uh, Tony Wolf next Sunday and bring somebody with you. Dan mentioned some other things we've got going, Super Bowl stuff, the, uh, the Valentine's thing. Guys, this is a great opportunity for you to get it right, okay? Take your wife out to dinner. You don't have to cook. You don't have to clean. Bring something shiny or smelly, okay? Diamonds are shiny. Perfume is smelly. Okay, if you give her something with a cord at Valentine's Day, you're liable to get something with iron in the side of the head. Okay, so don't don't mess this up, guys. All right. We've got a, a little video I want you to see. I think. Now I'll tell you when to start. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> All right, boys, fire her up. Now it'll take a minute for it to get going. It'll take a second. And we're gonna wait. Hold on, I have an idea. Hold on. I'll take this. Oh, there, there it goes. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, go! You disappeared. I have so much money. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Well, Yay! Yeah. Well, we, we, I want to. That's amazing. You did amazing. Good job on that. We're going to count the money during the break and okay. find out how much you're going home with. Uh -huh. Let's see how much you won. Can we have a drum roll? $816. How many of you have ever actually seen one of those money machines? Have you ever seen my do as well as she did? No, <laughs> they don't. Now, you say, why in the world are you showing that? Well, 
have you ever asked yourself, and, and maybe right now you're thinking, you know, sometimes my life feels like that when it comes to my finances. You know, it's like I'm in this money machine and I'm trying to get, you know, to meet my needs and pay my bills or, or whatever, and it seems like for every dollar you catch, you lose two. And it's, just, it's just crazy the things that sometimes we do or, or we feel like we have to do in order to get our finances the way we want them to be. And the fact is, if you feel that way, you're not alone at all. We've all felt that way once in a while, I'm sure. And, and the primary reason that I think people feel that way is because we're all guilty of making mistakes when it comes to our money. And, and that's why we, we started this series a couple of weeks ago, and we called it, I know this is, a, you know, some of you are going to freak out, it's stupid things smart people do. Now, I didn't say stupid people. And I know right now you're probably thinking of somebody that that would qualify for them, but it's not nice to call somebody stupid, right? But let's be honest. All of us have done something that, honestly, we could say, yeah, that was more than dumb. It was flat out stupid. And, and I think we do that. Uh, and we've all made mistakes. Hopefully, we've learned some things. And, you know, over the last two weeks, we talked about the number one stupid thing smart people do, and that is how they deal with debt. And this weekend, we're going to continue down that list. Now, if you missed the last couple of weeks and, and you're interested in this, you can go to bedfordacres.com. The, the last two sermons are on there. We've got a YouTube channel. You can find it there. And uh, it might be worth your while to, to listen to that, I, I think especially for younger people. Uh, maybe you're newly married, maybe you're not even married yet, maybe you're in high school and you missed one of those, I, I think it would really be helpful for you to learn up front, you know, from some of the mistakes that some of us made uh, when we were younger. And so you might want to do that. So for the next couple minutes, I, I want us to, to look at, you know, some more of these mistakes. And the thing is, I'm not doing this just to point out mistakes. I, I'm hoping to do this to help people that might be you know, kind of like you feel like you're in the money machine right now. You feel like, man, my, my financial situation's crazy. I've already made these mistakes. I'm drowning here. And so hopefully in sharing some of this, we can help you get out of some of that. And for everybody, hope hopefully we can set up some guardrails, some bumpers, if you will, to keep us from falling into some of these same mistakes. Malcolm Forbes said it like this, failure is success if we learn from it. Uh, we've all been there. How many times have you learned from a mistake? <laughs> yeah. How many times haven't you? How many times have we had to take that class over and over and over again? We, we can all be slow learners in some studies, right? And so let's, let's kind of try to avoid that. But even God's Word tells us that failures themselves can be used by God when it helps us grow. When it helps us learn. Matter of fact, in Romans 8, 28, it says it like this. And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. Now, that all things, that includes all the stupid things I've done. That, that includes all the, the stupid things that have been done to me. All those things work to the good for those of us that love him and are called according to his purpose and, and wanting to live according to his plan. So, last week and the week before, we talked about the very first mistake in this list. We talked about debt. Today, we're going to move on down the list and we're going to pick up a couple more of the mistakes that sometimes stupid things that smart people do. The first one we're going to talk about is actually mistake number two, and those are the get-rich schemes. Uh, you know, and, and this would be a, a variety of things. If any of you have one of those friends that that goes from one system to another, you know, that they've come to you and uh, they tell you, wow, I have got this great deal. Uh, I'm selling this thing. You can have a party at your house. And, and if you get several of your friends to come and they also agree to have a party and then they get some friends to have a party for them. And if you get enough of those people in your downlink, guess what? You'll get a check every month, and you won't have to do anything. How many of you got a friend like that? Nobody? You guys are lucky. How many of maybe you're the one like that? 
We've all seen it. it you know, and, and I'm not against Tupperware. I'm not against uh, fancy pots and pans. I'm not against Cutco knives. I'm home and terrier. You know, remember when home and everybody had that picture of the deer. Okay. Now remember, all of that, all those things were multi-level marketing. Infomercials. There's infomercials for days telling you how you can get rich. You know, you're not really generating anything. You're not really creating anything. You just go to the mailbox and you get your money. And there's a lot of people that fall for that. I've got, I've got one friend, won't mention his name. Hopefully he's not listening. If he is, he may not know I'm talking about him anyways. But he's one of these guys that has gone from one get rich scheme to another, to another, to another. He's my age. Guess what? He's still not rich. He's not. Now, many people, I think, have done that. And I think that's one of those get rich schemes that people do. I think another one, though, that most of us probably can relate to a little bit more is how many have tried to get rich by picking a few numbers with a special number. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but how many bought a ticket last week when Mega Millions was $1.3 billion? Okay. Now, I'm not saying if you ever bought a lottery ticket that you're going straight to hell or anything like that, but I will say this. If you bought a ticket last week, number one, I guarantee you didn't win because whoever won lives in, like, New England somewhere, so nobody here won it. Uh, you wasted your money is what you did. Let's be honest. Buying a lottery ticket, statistically, is a stupid thing that smart people sometimes do. Now, again, I'm not saying it's, it's terrible to throw down $2 on, hey, what's the, what the heck, it's not going to matter. It's just fun. I waste $2 on a pop anyway, okay? I'm not saying that. But how many times have you been to the convenience store on a Wednesday or a Saturday? Isn't that when lotto comes out? When the lotto numbers come out? And you've seen people buying a whole stack of lotto tickets? And you look at them, you see the car they're driving, and you realize that is somebody who does not need to be buying lottery tickets. Because the bottom line is they're thinking, hey, I can spend $2 and I can become a multi-millionaire. It's a scheme. It's a scheme. Henry Fielding said a lottery is a tax on all fools in creation. Someone else said the lottery is a tax on poor people. He was right. How many wealthy, how many times have you seen somebody drive up in a Lexus or a, a, a new Cadillac or a brand new Ford F-150 or push in their Chevy, uh, you know, a new Chevy, buying lottery tickets? Really, you don't often see what people that you would say, that guy's wealthy. You don't see them buying lottery tickets. Why? Because they got their wealth making good financial decisions, not poor ones. And they amassed their wealth by hard work, not looking for a gimmick. Uh, now, let me suggest something. Because I know good and well what I just said. You know, some of you are going, yeah, that's right, and you're still going to go buy lottery tickets. Some people buy scratch-offs every single day. Okay, let, let, let's say this. You spend $2 a day. I mean, what's $2? A Diet Mountain Dew costs more than $2 if you buy them at the store. Okay, so you give up your Diet Mountain Dew, you give up your tea, or, or maybe you don't go to that, what's that new place in town, B whatever, that sells those foo-foo drinks? I know a bunch of you go there, I see it on Facebook. Well, they're 6 $8 a piece. You could buy three lottery tickets for what those things cost. But let's say you're going to spend, Yeah, I, I'm not going to listen to you, Dean, I'm going to spend, I'm going to buy a $2 ticket every day. I'm going to make you a deal. Give me the $2 every single day this year. And at the end of the year, I promise I will give you $400 back. You say, wait a second. If I give you $2, that's like $730 or something I've given you. You don't have to give me $400? Guess what? If I give you $400 back, statistically, you will get more back than if you bought $2 worth of lottery tickets every single day this year. My address is 232 Northern Drive. I take checks. If enough of you do it, I will sign up for Venmo. I'm here for you. Folks playing the lottery expect to get rich, and it won't work. 
It's a stupid thing that some smart people seem to do. And I can't point to some 11th commandment in Exodus where, where it says, thou shalt not gamble. But if you're doing that to satisfy that itch to get rich, you're blowing it. It's wrong. I, I even read a sermon online about a lady who took a can of tuna with her when she played the slots. She thought having it not open, <laughs> an open can of tuna while she was playing the slot machines would bring her good luck. I, you know, I've never been around a lot of gamblers. I've, I've been at a casino one time in my life just because if I could say, hey, I went to a casino. I was doing a wedding out in Salt Lake City. My friend said, hey, let's go over to Wendover, Nevada. So we got in the car, drove across the Bonneville Salt Flats. I got $2 worth of nickels, you know, a roll. And I played the nickel slots for about two hours, and then I ran out of nickels. So I can say I've been to a casino, okay, full of smoke, all kinds of crazy stuff, I guess, going on. I would never recommend going that. I will say this. I did not run at anybody with an open can of tuna playing the slots. But I did see people sitting there one dollar after another, after another, after another, after another. And I guarantee there's a whole lot of them that think they have a special seat. They have a special thing they wear. They have a special thing that will give them luck. I would say, if you knew everybody, and I'm sure some of our horse people could probably answer this, there's probably people at Keeneland, there's probably people at Churchill that have some kind of a system they think will help them win. It's kind of interesting, though, because if we believe in luck, it is, dis it is to disbelieve in God. Okay, let me say that again. If you're, if you're relying on luck... You cannot be trusting God. And, and I think it, it's sad to think that God was reduced to a can of fish for some woman when it comes to meeting her needs. Matter of fact, it's interesting, the book of Isaiah in chapter 65, it says this in verse 11. But as for you who left our Lord, who forgot about my holy mountain, who worship the God luck, who hold religious feasts for the God fate. I decide your fate, and I will punish you with my sword. You will all be killed because I called you, but you refused to answer. I spoke to you, but you wouldn't listen. You did the things I said were evil and chose to do things that displease me. Get rich schemes. Maybe it's playing the lottery. Maybe it's playing the ponies. Maybe it's, you know, something like that. But another thing I think people do in that same vein is something called day trading. Okay, do you know what day trading is? And this, this is a post that is, this is a warning posted by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission on their website. Okay, listen to this. Day traders rapidly buy and sell stocks throughout the day in the hope that their stocks will continue climbing or falling in value for the seconds to minutes they own the stock, allowing them to lock in quick profits. Day trade, this is their website. Day trading is extremely risky and can result in substantial financial losses in a very short period of time. Dave Ramsey, you're probably familiar with him, he said that over 90% lose money and not just a little in day trading. Folks, day trading is gambling, it's gambling with the stock market. And, and sometimes, I, now if you've got all kinds of money and you say, hey, you know what, i got got $1,000 that I can just blow, you're blessed to do that, and you want to dicker around with that, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong. But if you're thinking you're going to get rich by picking six numbers, or you're going to get rich by day trading, or you're going to get rich in, in some multi-level plan, you're making a terrible mistake. First Timothy says it like this in chapter 6, verse 9. People who, belong, who long to be rich soon began to do all kinds of wrong things to get money. Things that hurt them and make them evil-minded and finally send them to hell itself. For the love of money is the first step towards all kinds of sin. Some people have even turned away from God because of their love for it and as a result have pierced themselves with many sorrows. There's an old axiom that says, and you, you've heard it, hopefully you've accepted it, it says, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And yet, 
Smart people fall for some of these things every day. We need to avoid the mistake of the get-rich schemes. The second mistake, third in the list, you got debt, get rich. Third mistake is not having savings. Folks, there are basically two types of people sitting here right now. Those who believe in saving for, saving for retirement and those who believe in the retirement fairy. You know uh, the retirement fairy is, don't you? You're familiar with the retirement fairy. It's also known as Social Security. Now think about this. Consider these statistics. In 1937, for every one person that was drawing out of Social Security, there were 17 people paying in. Jump 30 years, 1967. Now there are 13 people paying in, one drawing out. It's already down four. 30 years later, 1997, you have only five people paying into Social Security for every one person drawing out. Ten years later, not 30, 10 years, 2007, you have two people paying into Social Security, one drawing out. So if you think that you don't need to set aside some savings, you don't need to prepare for retirement, you're just going to trust Uncle Sam to take care of you, you are trusting in the retirement fairy. And the retirement fairy is just like the, I'm sorry, we got little kids here. If they're little, hold their ears. The retirement fairy is in the same camp as the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. In case you don't know, they're not real. Dave Ramsey calls this social insecurity. I mean, think about it. Social security was started with a good intention, but over the years, our government has used it as their personal piggy bank. Every time they need something, they say, oh, we'll just take it as Social Security. And, and hey, folks, if you're on state retirement here in Kentucky, our state government has done some of the same thing with your retirement. So you better be planning on saving beyond some of that. Now, I, uh, Proverbs chapter 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Now, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is, most of you in here will live to be at least 75 years old. The bad news is that most of you in here will live to be 75 years old. And the difference, whether that is good or bad, is what you're doing today. Are you saving? But let me give you some figures, a little bit of math here to consider. If you were to put away in savings $50 a month and only get 6% interest, in 20 years, that $50 a month, you will have invested $12,000 and you will have made a profit of, actually made a profit of $11,000 more, but you will have $23,000. You'd almost double your money. Now, if you put $100 a month and you get 9% in 20 years, you will have put in $24,000, but you'll have $66,000 to show for it. If you right now are 40 years old or less, and you put in $200 a month in savings somehow, and don't touch it for 30 years at 9%, you will get back $363,225. That is five times your initial investment, just in savings. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go to the bank and put it in a savings account because the savings account right now is not getting you 9%. But there are plenty of places where you can, you know, there's, and there's people that would gladly help you do that. But if you're 40 and you don't get around to saving, let me suggest that you consider moving to Florida or Texas. Because living in a cardboard box is a lot easier on you in a warm climate. Bottom line, folks, there's no guarantee we're going to have Social Security. There's no guarantee that, you know, they're talking right now. I, I saw on the news this morning, people in eastern Kentucky, over in Pike County, the, their electric has gone up so much.
people on fixed income are saying, I, I cannot pay my electric. They own their house outright. And yet their Social Security isn't enough. So a stupid thing that smart people do <laughs> is not saving. Let, let's, not, let's not be that. Let's not be that. Don't squander your future on a new truck. Don't squander your future on a new boat. Don't squander your future on game systems and stuff that you really don't have to have. It, you know, if you've got the money to do it, fine. But if you don't have money going into saving, you don't have the money to do it. Mistake three. Number four on the list. Being lazy. Just being lazy. There are a lot of people, young and old alike, that make this mistake. They're just lazy. Or as, as we used to call them, they're just ornery. Make no mistake, the Bible does not encourage laziness in any way, shape, or form. Matter of fact, it strongly condemns it. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24, and, and this is a Jewish rabbi's translation. You've probably never heard this one. But uh, the hands of the diligent shall produce wealth, while the lazy shall pay taxes. Now, <laughs> I know a whole lot of hardworking people that pay taxes, but what he's talking about is when you're lazy, you're just hurting yourself. Wealth is, someone said wealth is 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. Proverbs 10, 24, or 10, 4 says a lazy person will end up poor, but a hard worker will become rich. 2 Thessalonians, Paul's writing to the church in verse chapter 3, verse 6, he says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command with the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from any Christian who lives in idleness, that's laziness, and doesn't follow the tradition of hard work we gave you. For you know that you ought to follow our example. We were never lazy when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It wasn't that we didn't have the right to ask you to feed us. But we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this rule. Whoever does not work should not eat. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that lazy is disliking activity or exertion. Maybe you were blessed with a college education, but somehow you got downsized, you lost your job, you're waiting for the right job to come along, but right now you're having a problem paying your bills. If you will not consider flipping burgers or delivering pizza because you dislike that activity, guess what? The, the dictionary definition I just says says you're lazy. Or I'm lazy. <laughs> you want to see a picture of lazy? Go to Walmart. How many times you pull into Walmart? Or you go to Save a Lot. And you pull into the parking lot. And you pull into a parking spot. And you can't get in that parking spot. Because somebody left a buggy or cart. Who calls that? How many people call that a, a, a shopping cart? How many call it a buggy? Thank you. And this is what you do. You grab the buggy, and when you're done with it, you put it in what? The cart corral. <laughs> but how many times you go out there and you see somebody so stinking lazy, they won't put a buggy or cart back where it belongs. If you're too ornery to put a buggy back, what's that say? I love it. I, we go to Costco, my wife and I. Love Costco, especially when they got the samples out there. And you walk 14 miles in Costco, right? You're just wore out. And, you, of course, you park way out somewhere. And, and you see it. I get it. People have walked 14 miles. They, they unload their cart, and they're so exhausted they can't take another step. So they leave the cart right there. I saw Henri and Lazy this morning. I was driving to church. I drove by the rock. Does anybody drive by the rock this morning? See the sign? They're looking for help. Did you look right across the street and see the sign at McDonald's? It says they're looking for help, starting at, what, $12, $15 an hour? Oh, and if you also looked at the, mar at the sign there by Sonic, guess what? They're looking for help, too. Now, I didn't see anything because I was trying to pay attention to the road a little bit, and I didn't see anything at Arby's, but I'll bet you there was one at Arby's. And I'll bet you if you went the other way, there was probably one at uh, DQ, 
There was probably one at KFC. There's probably one at Long John Silver's. Guess what they all say? We're looking for help. Amen. What's that say? There's a whole lot of lazy people. And I'm going to tell you something. Being lazy is one of the stupidest things we can do. And there's a lot of smart people that are lazy people. And that's one of the big mistakes we make with our money. Genesis chapter 3, 19 says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. Folks, Jesus was a worker. He was not lazy. He was not ornery. A guy named Albert Hubbard said this, People who never do any more than they get paid for, never get paid for any more than they do. So let's wrap this up. I want you to think back on the money machine. Some people live their lives looking for that magic money machine. They try to come up with some kind of system where they can, you know, magically money will be dumped into their lap or their bank account. Some make a mistake of not saving anything and holding out for retirement fairies. And some are just ornery. They're just too lazy. And, and these are all stupid things that otherwise smart people do. But what about the spiritual side of this? Are you thinking that there is some magic scheme that will take care of your sin debt? Because the Bible's clear, we have a sin debt. It says in Romans that all have sinned. Everybody has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. So you and I, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this incredible debt. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? It's death. It's eternal separation from God. So we've had this debt. What are we counting on to address that debt? Are you thinking that you can be good enough? I mean, in, in physical death or physical debt, you know, financial debt, we do that, okay? I owe so much, and, and I know I got to pay it back, so I start to pay it back, and so I pick up a couple extra shifts. I, I pick up a side gig so that I can, you know, so I can make more money to pay that back. Do, do you think that's going to work? I, I know I've messed up spiritually. I know that I'm a sinner, and, and so if I do enough good stuff, It'll balance that. That won't work. <laughs> and here's another one that people kind of hang on to. That they really are honest about their sin and they say, you know what? I know I'm a sinner, but I, but I look across the aisle or I look across the street or, or I watch the news. And I say, you know what? When it comes to spiritual things, I'm a meathead. I'm a mess. But at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And we think just because in my mind I can justify maybe my debt's a little bit less, which it's not, <laughs> but I'm okay. Kind of in the same vein, stupid thoughts <laughs> that smart people have. Where are your eternal savings? Have you invested your life in the cause of Christ? Or are you just making... Uh, you know, are you just making all the investments of time and talent and treasure right here? I'm not investing anything there. I'm doing it all for me, for mine, right now. What ministries are you involved in? Who are you serving? And what about being spiritually lazy? If you're really honest. Would you, would you have to say, you know what, probably when it comes to spiritual things, I'm, yeah, I'm a little ornery. I'm not in God's word every day. Why not? I'm not really supporting the work of the church like I should with tithes and offerings. I mean, it's because I got a boat to pay for. <laughs> or I got lottery tickets to buy. Or I got these other things that are, I really don't trust God. Are you tempted to just sit each week and watch a show, but unwilling to really be changed? You know, 
at the last song before I came up. We were singing God of Revival. And obviously Lane was in tune with what the Holy Spirit wanted. By opening up the front. And there were quite a few people that came up. Because they wanted to pray. You know, maybe they came up to pray with somebody else. Maybe they came and realized, you know what, there's this stuff in my life that I'm not winning and I want to win, and I want to turn that over to God. And so they came up here, and people prayed with them. And I am so proud of every one of you that did that. But I guarantee there were others that didn't come. And it probably wasn't because you didn't think you needed to. More than likely, it was because you thought about, what will somebody think of me if I do? God did not send a money machine. God loved you and me so much that he sent a son. And it's amazing, the number one competition God has in this world, the number one competition he has for your allegiance and my allegiance is money and stuff. Because if you're trusting your money, if you're trusting your stuff, you won't trust God. Now, I'm not saying you don't need money. I'm not saying it's wrong to have stuff. I'm just saying it's wrong when you put a priority on that than what you trust. That's why Jesus talked about money and possessions more than he talked about heaven, hell, or prayer combined. Really? Yeah, really. Because he knew that it was money and stuff that would stand in the way of us truly living lives committed to him and trusting him. God didn't send a money machine. He sent his son. What have you done about that? As the team comes, let me ask the question. Have you accepted by faith the free gift of salvation and forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers? It's super simple. Do you admit that you're a sinner? The Bible says we all are. It's not like you're admitting something the rest of us wouldn't. Do you realize I can't fix this on my own? If I could have, I already would have. By faith, I'm going to accept that the payment he gave on the cross covered me too. And I accept that gift as my own. And then you say, you know what, God? <laughs> I've been driving this car myself, and I drove it in the ditch so many times, it's been up on every corner. Repentance literally is saying, God, <laughs> here's the keys. Letting him drive your life. You've been going this way, and you know this way it's not working. And you're saying, okay, I'll go this way. I'll accept that gift. I'll commit my life to him. And he says, if you really believe that, you'll tell people about it. He says, if you really believe that, one of the first things you can do is be baptized Connect with a great church. Be in a group where you can be discipled and challenged. Now, here's the bottom line. You're either going to trust Him or you're going to trust some version of the money machine. It may not be money. It may be the good works machine. It may be the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to charity machine. It may be the I'm better than somebody else machine. But either way, you're going to grab and you're going to grab and you're going to grab and you're going to lose. But you don't have to. Think back 30 minutes ago. Think back while we were singing that song. If you were sitting there and you said, wow, I need to go. <laughs> Even if you weren't thinking that then, maybe you are now. I want to turn something over to God. I want to make this my church home. I, I, I've never been baptized. I want to be obedient to that. I got a prayer need. It has nothing to do with what you talked about, Dean, but I want you to pray for me. Or I want somebody to. Will you do that? Father, you're the God of revival. Do what only you can do. Move in our hearts. Thank you for a son, not a money machine. Give us the courage to stand up for you right now. To move when you say move. To 
go where you say go. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me? our service, but that doesn't mean that God's door is shut. The thought of walking up here in front of uh, 300 of your closest uh, strangers <laughs> is terrifying. I get that. If you'd like to talk to one of us, catch us up here. Catch me on the lobby. Catch Dan or, or anybody, and they'll, they'll get you the right person. Don't leave here today without settling what's going on. Don't go out of here and grab that spiritual money machine and think it's going to work, because it won't. Appreciate you being here. Don't forget, we've got a lot of stuff going on in the next couple of weeks. Invite somebody to your house for the Super Bowl. <laughs> Come out to the Valentine's thing. There's all kinds of goodies going on. Don't miss those opportunities. Make sure you welcome somebody around you. Thank you so much for coming. God bless.